the sidelines for a long time Now I'm finally getting in the game at the bow time This is my time, this is my time The only thing I consider impossible is losing I've been waiting on the sidelines for a long time Now I'm finally getting in the game at the bow time This is my time, this is my time The only thing I consider impossible is losing BetUS, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. BetUS, where the game begins. This stream is being powered by BetUS. Receive a 125% bonus. The link is in the description of the video. The bonus isn't just for your first deposit, but your first three deposits with BetUS, ladies and gentlemen. Up to $2,500, 24-7 customer service if you need any help, and 24-hour fast and easy payouts, all right? Listen, I'm excited about tonight's show brought to you by BetUS. Supporting our sponsors is supporting the channel. Listen, um, I was taking a look at the BetUS odds as of late. The draft is coming up, ladies and gentlemen. And I got to be honest with you, even though the Miami Dolphins are not picking in the top 10, will we move up in the draft is something that I've been thinking about lately. Is there a player that um, Chris Greer really loves that might cause him to move up. Time will tell, but what I do know is that BetUS has the odds for the draft already listed. The first quarterback selected is already listed. Caleb Williams and minus 3,500. Drake May plus 1,400. You also have first non-QB selected. I'm going to be honest with you. That Marvin Harrison Jr. pick is looking very secure on that. Minus 650, but it is a guarantee. 
yeah, I can't say it's a guarantee, but it definitely feels like a guarantee if you're trying to get on that, all right? Also, Mr. Irrelevant. Is Mr. Irrelevant going to be an offensive player um, or a defensive player, or is it a kicker or a punter? All of those odds are listed. What position is the Mr. Irrelevant going to be? That's also listed. Second overall pick. That's listed as well, all right? So, ladies and gentlemen, all of your draft specials are up on BetUS. Make sure you check them out. Hit the like button on your way in the building. Let's go ahead and get started because we got a lot to talk about tonight um, that we want to get through. Punch the like button before we get started. We want to try to get over 100 likes um, right away at the beginning of the stream. Um, and thank you to all those who have subscribed to the channel. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, we continue to hit new thresholds and yes, we got 50 likes with almost 220 people watching right now. So punch that like button and let's go ahead and dive in. Cause I want to be efficient tonight and get through a lot of the things that I want to talk about. Okay. All right. So I want to pick up where we left off two nights ago. Um, you know, the wife, um, she wanted me to spend some time with her yesterday, so I spent that time with her. So here we are back today, and I want to pick up where we left off. We hit a lot of things in the last stream. If you didn't check it out, make sure you go check it out. We talked about Brian Thomas Jr. at number 21, the wide receiver out of LSU. We talked about Tua cutting his weight, gaining speed and agility, um, per Nick Hicks would perform. We talked about Chris Greer was cooking, or is he? We talked about Michael Thomas' potential. We talked about the salary caps, um, where we are. Uh, we also talk about Fields going for a six-round pick and a possible fourth um, to his extension. What was taking so long? Tyron Smith to the Jets. We talked about the Tyreek drama. Um, and we'll pick up where we left off, okay? All right, so the another question that was asked of me last, on the last stream was, Tua playing good in big games. Do I see that happening? Okay? All right, so... Based off of conventional wisdom, I don't see it happening. Based off of history, right? There is zero evidence to prove that he will be able to play lights out against, you know, in big games. Now, when we say big games, I want to make sure that we add context to it. It's not just big games. We could have played the P Panthers in the last week of the season last year. It would have been a big game, but we would have blew him out and two would have had a great game. You know, we I mean, so that's not what it is, okay? You cannot judge a quarterback by saying big games when the big game is relative to when it happens as well. So the, the, the fair thing to do when you talk about, you know, quarterbacks and big games, timing is a fact.
Testing, testing. Can you all hear me? Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Mm. Yes, okay. Sorry, guys. We just had a blackout. All the power went out, so obviously the internet got knocked out. Um, so I had to turn on my phone's hotspot. And um, the power came back after like 30 seconds. So we're back now. Yes, sir. Fuzzy picture. That's probably because I'm on my phone's internet. So um, until my internet loads up again, um, I'm on my phone internet. So thank you all for the um, patience. But yeah, the internet got knocked out. The, all the power went got knocked out. Um, but we're good. I guess we'll pick up where we left off and keep it moving. All right. All right. So let's do it. All right, man. I done lost track of where I was. Somebody said cricket wireless. No, we're good. It's just the power went out. All right. Two outside the crib, TD. He took the power now. No. Nah. All right. So we were talking about two of playing good in big games, and I wanted to add context to that. Okay. So what is a big game in the NFL? A big game is late in the season, everything on the line. Your record basically says you haven't clinched anything yet, and it's very important for you to win the game because you need it to get in the playoffs. Um also, maybe you did clinch, but you have a chance to get yourself a first round by. Um, and some people say, well, week one is just as important. And I do agree with that. But when we talk about big games, it's when you see the path, you know the outlook. Big games, in my opinion, kind of starts around week 12 of the season. Now, if you're, you know, five and seven, I mean, if you're five and no, no, let me let me say if you're like four and and five, then yeah, every game from that point on is a big game starting in what week week 10. Well, you know, um, that makes sense. But usually it's every game after week 12 when it's critical. Your games are critical at that point. Not only that, it also has the element of it needs to be a solid opponent at minimal. That's what you call a big game. If the Dolphins are going to go up against the Panthers in week eight, you know, the last week of the season, and they're just bad, they've won two games all season, you can say it's a big game because you got to win it to get in, but it's not as big as people want to make it out to be. So there are several factors when you talk about a big game, okay? So what big games have to have? We've come down the stretch in year one where Buffalo game, you win and you're in. That was a big game. Thank you, baby. Division opponent. That's it. Division opponent. Rival. A team that could arguably at the time have been better, right? You win and you're in. That's a big game. Year two of this, um, or year three of this rebuild, or year two of two of, you know, Tennessee Titans. It started there. That wasn't the only big game. The week after that would have been a big game, but Tennessee derailed us, so it didn't matter. You got to beat Tennessee. You can lose to Tennessee. And you are the better team. That's a big game. Two years ago, the record was perfect. We were doing, putting in some work. We were like eight and three or nine and three. Bam. It don't get much better than that. You roll into San Francisco. Technically, it wasn't a big game. But when you lost it, it became big. Then the Chargers. 
technically it shouldn't it shouldn't have been considered a big game, but when you lost, it became that way because now your record, now you're starting to lose the division because you had the division, but you're starting to lose the division. That's why those games were big. Buffalo game. That was a big game. Lost. And the Green Bay game was the biggest of them all. You can't go on a four-game losing streak because now we're talking about potentially getting kicked out of the wild card. Huge game. Christmas Day. The opponent isn't even better than us. Lost. Then he wasn't on the field anymore. So as far as two of big games, none of the rest of them matter. And we had to win one more to get in the playoffs, and thankfully we got a win. One win. And last year, last year, last year, last year, nobody, well, I'm not going to say nobody. There was a perfect path towards a collapse. And it happened. And it happened. Perfect path to a collapse, ladies and gentlemen, and it happened. The Tennessee Titans game was not a big game. It was prime time. It was a little 2C game, but it wasn't a big game. And we lost. Dallas Cowboys at that point actually wasn't a big game. And we won. And at that point, when you saw the picture was clear that Buffalo is winning and they keep winning, that's when the big game started. Okay, we can't keep falling like this because if we do, then we're in trouble with Buffalo. Now we must win. Now we must win. Baltimore was a huge game. Lost. Then you had the Buffalo again, massive game, lost, and we lost the division. And then you get in the playoffs, huge game, because every playoff game is a huge game. You lose and you're home. You win and you keep going. And we lost. So when we add, when you ask me the question, two are playing good in big games, what evidence do we have of that? Because when you go all the way back, how did he play in that Buffalo game his rookie year? Terrible. How did he play in that Tennessee game two years ago? Trash. How did he play versus the 49ers, the Chargers, the Bills, and Green Bay all together? Horrible. How did he play versus Baltimore, Bills, and Chiefs? Liability. So there is zero evidence that suggests that Tua is going to play good in big games. But what's causing him not to play good in big games? That's what the conversation needs to be. Um, it's his limitations because when you look at the common theme of the teams that he, he doesn't play well against, they all run similar defenses. They, TV, is your mic connected? You know what? I, I'm glad you said that because it's actually not connected. So I'm turning it on now. Thank you for saying that. You're probably hearing a computer pick up my my um voice. Thank you, Steve, because it's not connected. It's coming up now since you said that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Matter of fact, it's up now. Let me make sure I switch to the right audio. All right. Testing, testing. Now the mic should be working. Y'all let me know if you hear a difference. It should be working now. Okay. So 
why is Tua not playing well in these games? You got to look at the defenses. All of the defenses that Tua doesn't play well against, right? There's two different style of defenses. All right? One defense is playing man coverage, man press coverage. Literally, and I've been telling y'all this for a long time now, one defense is taking away his first read and sending pressure at the same time. And Tua thrives off of his first read. He's very good and accurate because first, when you throw into your first read, it's the most perfect timing. It's what you work on every day. Three-step drops, hitches, five-step drops, you know. Um, I mean, it's what you work on all the time. <laughs> One, two, three, turn, bam, ba ba ba, bam. You know, it's the typical. Looking the safety off, coming back, bam, just timing. It's what, you know, it's what he's most accurate at because it's what he puts the time in on. But how can you get that much better with your reads after the first read when you don't practice a lot going to the next read? See, what a lot of people need to understand is I believe Tua has really been honing in on, first of all, making sure he knows the playbook and where to go. And when you don't know the playbook, you want to make sure that you get that at a bare minimum correct. So your first read is what you lean on the most because it's your most reliable. It's the good old faithful. As long as I know the play, I know where I go first. But when you look at Mike McDaniel's offense, what people need to understand is Mike McDaniel's offense isn't truly progression-based. How many times have we watched film and we see the film, the, the field get cut in half? See, when you have a progression-based offense, you have all your options. If five guys are going out on a route, all five guys are an option, depending on what the defense does. Depending on what the defense does. But how many times have I proven to you all on tape? Who is looking left? The two guys to the left are running routes hard, and the other three guys on the right are looking back over at the two guys on the left to see, did they catch the ball? They're half running their routes. They're all the, the play ain't, the ball ain't even thrown yet. They're looking back, not at two, but who's supposed to get the ball? How many times have I showed us that on film? So that shows you it's not even a progression-based offense. So people are like, oh, he's going through progressions. Look, he looked there, then he looked over there. He has, it's an option-based offense. And what I mean by that is the offense is built off of reading one or two guys on the defense. So when Tua hikes the ball, he gets to read. If the linebacker goes to the flat, I can hit the guy in the seam or the quick slant. If the linebacker stays put, I can hit the flat. If the linebacker stays put and I look to the flat and the corner's there, I go over the top. If the safety comes downhill, I automatically take the shot to the left. It's options. And nothing's wrong with that. The only issue is when you play a defense that plays man coverage, then you don't have to worry about the linebacker going there, the corner dropping instead of following the receiver or the safety coming downhill. You have one-on-one -on -one outside corner. The linebacker is always going to follow the um, slot, and you have a slot corner on the slot receiver, and it is in zone coverage. So when he hikes the ball – no option is open. He has to then wait on his guy to beat the other guy. And he's still staring him down. Okay, are you going to beat him? Are you going to beat him? 
I've always said you run zone two is going to slice you up. But teams have now found a version of zone coverage as well that does very well against Tua now. It's quarters and cover three. And you zone the um front end, the 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 um the shallow end of the defense. So what does that look like? You always have a safety deep. You always have the corners backpedaling. So right there alone, you eliminate the deep pass automatically. And in the cover three or the quarters, a lot of times the linebackers play the intermediate on the inside. So what do, what does these plays leave open? The only thing that these plays leave open are the flats. Are the flats. And we don't do that much because it's not typically our first read. This is why you watch a lot of film and you say, Tua needs to learn to take his check down. Tua needs to learn to take the guy in the flat. Tua needs to learn to just hit the guy right there, right? That's why some games, when it's over, hindsight, right? We say, man, there was guys underneath all day. And let me throw another caveat into this. I've seen Mike McDaniel see them run those coverages, cover three, cover four, and it, and, and it not be open and the flat be open. This is when you get Mike McDaniel running those plays where the first read is the flat or the bubble screen. You notice some games he'll hike and throw it in the flat right away, throw it in the bubble screen, or he'll hike, step back, and throw it in the flat. He was never going to throw in the field. It was designed to go in the flat. Those are the moments they're trying to counteract that. But what that's creating with our offense is a guessing game. We don't have an offense that can really go progression-based to find the open guy, so we have to have the guessing game. Q, yes, cover four is um, quarters. I was saying cover three and quarters. I could have said cover four. Doesn't matter. Um. But yeah, our offense turns into a guessing game. This is why in those bad games, if you notice, they shut us down all game, but there's like three plays where like, ooh, he hit him on for the 20-yarder because we guessed right. We guessed right. That's it. That's what our offense has become against those teams. So the league has now found that man coverage works very well if you're going to press. And if you're going to press the um, receivers with the deep safety. And they've also figured out those are the two zone packages that work very well against Miami as well. Zone the middle of the field. Keep your your quarters or your your cover three. Let those guys go back to a fiend against the deep ball. And now you're asking Tua to beat you on the outside of the numbers and in the shallow. That's what you're asking for. And he's not good on the outside. And in the shallow, for some reason, he struggles for some reason. And a lot of people would dispute the things that I'm saying right now, but it's been proven. I mean, we so we watch it on film on this channel all the time. All the time. So can he play well against good teams in, in, in big games? That's going to depend on Mike McDaniel this year and his quarterback coach helping him improve his flaws. Helping him improve his flaws. So someone said, dang, TD. So every play we are successful on is a guess. 
No. Sometimes Tua puts it up and our receiver makes a have a catch in contested coverage. But outside of that, here's what I'm saying to you. Against the trash teams in non-big games, it's not a guess. We see cover two, cushion. We just do what we already do. Let Tua cook them in the zone with timing. Put the ball in the spot. Let the receivers run by and keep catching it all day. That, that that's not guessing. That's they're gonna stay in this raggedy cover too. We'll just do what we normally do, and we're great at it, and we'll kill them. That's what we do. But what I'm asking you is, why is it that against the better defenses and the good teams that it doesn't work at all? That's the first indicator that shows you that it's all dependent on the type of defense you play. I show y'all all the time the sorry defenses, why they stay in the raggedy defense they do. Like, like, do you not notice that in those 10 trash teams we played this year? Why is it that Tyreek and Waddle, when they catch the ball, they're in a defender within 5 to 10 feet of them? There ain't even a defender close. They catch it. Like, they, when they catch the ball, they're shocked. They catch it, turn around like, oh, oh. Oh, nobody's around. All right, let me go. <laughs> like, do you never notice Tyreek will go up, catch the ball, come down, reset to check everybody out? Like, oh, okay. You don't notice how open those guys be? How easy they make it? Now, we think it's hard because... The ball's flying past defenders, and they're they're reaching for it. But it's zone coverage, and they're just finding the window. And we're just letting it rip. But why is it that when you play every single team that scheme specific, and you see the little wrinkles in their defense that's different than just the regular set, right? Why is it that they shut it down? Because they're running a different defense. A defense that shut that shuts down what we do well. So now we have to pull out our plays that'll beat that. But can our quarterback execute those plays that beat that? Can our receivers beat the jams that beat that? <laughs> like we have to stop acting like the film in the good games is the same as the film in the bad games we just didn't execute. That's not the case. I'm telling y'all, this is the thing that people need to take away from all of this. We have to stop acting like we were the same team in the good games uh, versus uh, versus the um in in versus the bad games. We have to stop acting like they those teams played the same defense and that we just didn't execute well on that day. We got to stop lying ourselves. We make it seem like, yeah, we didn't come out to play. No, they have our number. It's all on film. And we're going to do some film studies. We're going to continue to go over film. We can start doing the comparison. We could go to some of the games where we just absolutely tore teams apart. And I could show you, look at the cushion all game, no contesting. Like, like I, I could show you this stuff. I can show you the middle of the field just wide open, easy. But then when the other teams that are good, they clog up the middle, and we're like, oh, what do we do? That's the difference. Same plays. And I know that people don't want to accept that. It's hard to accept that your offense isn't really good. It's dictated on the other defense. I know we like to think, no, we went into those games and we took everything. When in reality, those teams are just trash and dumb defensive coordinators feeding right into our hands. Giving us the very thing that we do well. Giving us the exact things that we do well. Just hand, hand delivering it on a silver platter for us. 
we don't want to get big deep, so we're just we're gonna let y'all roam free in the middle of the field. Okay, <laughs> we'll take it, and we do. But your proof is when you play Baltimore, when you play Buffalo, when you play the Chiefs, and when you play all of these teams that specifically scheme to what we do well. They say, we don't want you to beat us deep and we don't want you to have the middle of the field. So we're going to clog the middle and we're going to take away the deep ball. We don't believe your quarterback can throw outside the numbers, so we'll give you that. And his first read ain't never in the shallow, so we'll give you that. And that's what these teams do. And that's why they obliterate us. Because what do we do? We hike the ball, still looking deep and still looking intermediate. Every play, they, they're giving you exactly your weakness and saying, if you want to beat us with your weakness, then, hey, you earned it, but we don't think you can. And here we are still trying to squeeze it all up in the middle and all deep. And we still get it sometimes, but don't act like it was easy. And that's why all the numbers drop. That's why all the points drop. That's why all the yards drop. That's why all the production drops on offense when we play those teams. And stop saying Tua got, got his tight end. No more excuses. He had his tight end two years ago with Mike Gusecki. That's not say. Come on now. Oh, Hunter Henry. Uh, I mean, not Hunter Henry, but um, John who better yards after the catch. Y'all about to find out. Y'all going to see what I'm talking about. Y'all really think that might be then you're going to target John U. Smith six plus times a game? Y'all think that? Do y'all think that might be Daniel giving John U. Smith six, to, six plus targets a game? C.D. Gasecki couldn't block. John U. Smith can't block no more. He can't block anymore. I don't know if you know that. That's something that fell off last year for him. Janu catching 23 of his 36 targets. Uh, that ain't good. We need more than that. Do you know Durham Smythe catching 31 of his 36 targets? The man 82% um, reception percentage, completion. Um, Durham Smythe. So I'm just saying, how many targets do you think Chanu getting? Come on now. Shout out to Jonah with the first super chat of the night said TD if Brock Bowers is sitting there at 15 pick 15. Um, should Miami trade up to get him? Uh, if he's sitting there at 15, you got to stay where you are and hopefully wait to see if he can fall to 21. It's just a reality, you know? Um, and where do you think he's going? Where, where do you think he's coming off of the board? I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I don't even think he will be there, but I will say this. Um, why do you want Brock Bowers? Why does any Dolphin fan want Brock Bowers? Because he's a good tight end and a good weapon. 
The Miami Dolphins do not utilize the tight end. I don't know why that's so hard for people to understand. First of all, we can't pick and pop right in the middle of the field often because Tua can't see over the line like that. That's why most things are bootleg, out on the run, sees the tight end coming across, hit him, or catching him in the flat. Another thing y'all need to realize, another reason why Tua doesn't often hit that five, six, seven yard route in the middle other than a timed slant because he doesn't see every lane. That's why everything is hash, hash on those slants on the out, not the outside the numbers, but between the hash and the numbers. That's why a lot of the passes are right there in that little slit. The only thing inside the numbers are the timing plays. Tyreek Waddle coming across. Timing, timing. Everything else is hash to the numbers. That little area, he sees those lanes through the tackle and the guards on both sides. Or the flat, those things. And the only other way he's going to see the tight end is when he gets about nine-plus yards down the field and he starts to see him. It's that simple. In Q, it is a slant. The guys aren't running up five yards and coming across. They're literally doing a one-two start coming across. That's your slant. Your in routes, they're actually getting some depth and then cutting in coming across. These guys are literally running the slants and they're doing it at the angle. It ain't coming straight across the line like the ins and the outs. Well, I'll show it to you on film. All right. Um, but I don't want to do that. You had like, why does everybody discount Mike Gusecki as a weapon? Like, I don't for the life of me, I don't understand it. Mike Gusecki, excuse me, was all you needed to know of how this offense wants to utilize the tight end. That's all you needed to know. But we keep talking about tight end, tight end. Oh, we got a tight end. Now, you had one. And we're talking about a weapon. He was just as good as anybody else catching the ball. Athlete can actually get up there, has a wingspan, making plays. I don't know why people think that another tight end is just going to make all the difference when we don't even target them like that. This is the Tyreek and Waddle show. Tyreek and Waddle show. TD, should we just give up? Um, Wait till Tua era is done? No, you just got to keep trying. You got to keep on trying to make things better. But a lot of the decisions being made are trash decisions. So we talk about them. That don't mean we give up. Week one of next year, even if I feel like the roster in the team is weaker than it was the year before, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm hoping we win. But we got to talk the truth. And the truth is, we made a lot of bad decisions that have landed us in this position that we're in today. And we keep on trying to cover them up and move forward. And a lot of people are content with that and think it's just fine. I try personally think that the conversation should be dominated by all of the bad decisions that we made to get to this point so that people can start to understand this game, the effects that it has so that they can call it out as soon as it happens, or they could be calling for the right people's job instead of blaming people like they do every year. It's Flores fault. It's um, Fangio's fault. It's everybody's fault everybody's fault. We're always blaming the wrong people. 
in masses too. So I know it's an issue. We blame the, the, the wrong people in masses. So no, we shouldn't give up. Just like I'm not going to give up trying to educate people on what the real issues are on this team. See, I always say this throughout the year, and I know people get sick and tired of me saying it, but I always say to y'all, why is it that every time I tell y'all something that you don't like and it ends up coming true, we don't acknowledge it? It's not to be negative. Like, I could be negative about everything, and obviously I'm going to be right sometimes because nothing's perfect, right? But do we really want to go and count how many things that I felt was a bad and it, and it actually was bad? Do we really want to go count? Because I'm going to tell you now, I got to be in the 90 percentile, and that's where the problem of this organization is. That's the issue. If you ever want to be a winner, if you ever want to win something and, and, and improve something, then you don't focus on the positive. You only focus on the negative because that's what's going to get you there. Just like Xavier Howard said today, when I mean, um, when it came out today, what Xavier Howard said about Flores, right? Flores will chew everybody out. This wasn't specific to Tua or nothing like that. Flores would chew everybody out, and when you did, and when you did wrong, as he should, and when you did good, he ain't who wrong you because it's your job. It was what you were supposed to do. Why am I gonna waste time over inflating the things you do well? See, that's that new age stuff. That 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 you need um you need validation. You need positive reinforcement to make yourself feel better. I I don't know why, but it's just in me. I've always been the type of person. I don't need none of the positive. I'm mad if you don't give me the negative. I'm mad if you don't give me something that I can overcome and prove you wrong with or get better at. That's all I want to focus on. If there's 10 things that I need to do to become a great podcaster, I don't care. I don't want to hear all the time how great I am at this, that, that, and this. I want you to, to, to tell me, hey, you suck at that. Okay, I, I want to try to get better in that area. That's what I want to hear. Because that's how you're going to get to the pursuit of potentially hitting all 10 things and being on point. And Xavier Howard said, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, he, me and him are weren't the big, we weren't the cool or nothing like that, but I respected it. I respected him because the one thing Flores was, was consistent with everybody. He delivered his message. He's on your flaws because he don't want to see them flaws because guess what? Them flaws are why we lose. Those flaw flaws are why we lose. And he talked to everybody that way. He talked to everybody that way. But there's some guys that can take it and try to be better in them. And some guys that cry and whine and say, you can't talk to people that way. Why can't he talk to people that way? Because those people can't take it. It hurts their feelings. It makes them emotional. These are facts. Why else can't you talk to people that way? Anybody that feels that he can't talk to people that way is because what did him talking to people that way do to those people? And now you got to say it out of your own mouth. Even the biggest supporters, they don't want to answer that question because they would have to say out of their mouth that kind of talk towards him hurt his feelings, made him emotional, made him doubt himself, made him unconfident, shook his confidence. 
And there lies you asking yourself, dang, if you could be, if that, if it could do all of that to you, words, then how much of a leader are you? How much of a dog are you? That's the truth. The hard truth that a lot of people don't want to talk about. They'll tune the show out right now. I don't want to hear this no more because it's too much for you too. And the only reason you sympathize is because you feel the same way. And forgive me because to each his own, who am I to judge? But I will say that's the difference between certain people. Some people can take it and react to it in a way that makes them go get it. And some people cave up and it hurts. That hurts my feelings. But you don't want to hear that from me because it makes you what sound seem soft. Sound soft. Don't, 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 don't cop out like that. Don't take that route. It's just who you are. It is what it is, but there's different type of people. That's just a reality. So Flores hurt some people's feelings. And so, and some people were able to take it and tried to rise to the occasion and respected it. Like Jerome Baker, like Xavier Howard, they respected it. H says all feelings matter. They sure do to the individual. Because Flores don't care about your feelings. I'm that type of person. I can empathize with your feelings. But when it comes to something like this, competitive sport and football, when it came to me when I was in corporate America working, I could care less about your feelings. There's a job that needs to get done. And just because you it, it, something made you feel some type of way, I can't get the production that we require. Oh, no. If I'm a football coach, I can care less about your feelings. There is a job that get, needs to get done. This is a male league where the expectation is for you to do your job without complaining and crying about it because we need the results. And if you can't deliver the results, then I need to let you know how I feel about that and not sparing your feelings. Because if you don't get your results, then I don't get my results and I get fired and I have a wife and children and I'm not going to let you fight, get me fired to save my life. So when you got a coach that has that mentality and he gets fired, this is exactly why people feel like our organization is full of a bunch of pie soft individuals from top to bottom. This is why Deshaun Elliott's press conference, he was saying the things he said. This is a real football team. When he was talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers, everybody know he was throwing subtle shots. And it's so funny that when Xavier Howard tells his truth, Deshaun Elliott tells his truth, now they're the enemy. Oh, they're bitter we didn't resign them. Oh, X just trying to get a job. Why they got, why, why, why y'all got to assassinate them now because it doesn't fit the narrative? I see some of y'all in the chat. You make up a lot of BSTD. Well, can you make up the reason why we keep losing for the last 24 years? Can you give me the reason why? Can you let everybody know, Sam, the reason why we've lost for the last 24 years? And I can guarantee you, you're going to bounce around to 10 to 15 different reasons. And you and, and then most of the time, when you get to 10 to 15, 20 different reasons, then none of them are the reason. There's one big reason. This organization has gone soft. 
That's what I conclude. We have gone soft. We get all in our feelings from top to bottom. And this is why when you get a coach that comes in ready to straighten it out and clean it up and bring some structure and discipline, like Brian Flores did, it's too much for this organization. Straight pie. Straight, just, oh, uh, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And then what do we do as a result? We go get all these finesse players. We don't get too many real dogs on this team. We stay away from dogs. We, we, we go get all the finesse players, the really good finesse players. You know, the, and then when they get punched in the mouth or pushed around on the football field, we like, what happened? I don't, I just don't understand. Every time it's because we're soft. That's exactly what it is. We coddle certain players. Like, I want y'all to really think about it. Even at the quarterback position. It is a, Chris Greer does just because we had Ryan Fitzpatrick that caused a, a, a dispute. Chris Greer has yet to like Chris Greer has had so many opportunities. Forget Watson, forget Brady, forget Lamar. How many opportunities did Chris Greer at least have to go get some of the most solid backups in the NFL? And he's just terrified to do it. Just won't do it for some of the lowest prices you could find. We don't want to insult our current quarterback. He's already been through enough. That's why when they always say things like, oh, well, that team killed their quarterback confidence. Oh, they destroyed him. They killed his confidence. Then, ladies and gentlemen, I don't ever want a quarterback who confidence can be killed. Do y'all not understand that? Like, like real dogs, you can't kill their confidence. They could be 20% completion, be the worst thing in the NFL, and they talking like a dog on the podium. They on that podium, well, I'm gonna be I'm gonna get better and I'm gonna show I'm gonna prove everybody wrong. All the way to they out of the league. Those are real dogs. They killed his confidence. They blah blah. Like, come on. Well, you can't expect the guy to play well under those conditions. <laughs> you can't expect the guy to play well under condi those conditions. Man. Dogs inspire the team. I like that NFL is lit. They do. Because guess what? Let me say this about two or two. Y'all don't understand. See, sometimes it take the leader of the team being chewed out and they take it on the chin and they go out and they get pumped up and, and react to it on the field to uplift other people. But you don't think when players see Tua, you can't talk to people that way and cussing back at the coach and going back and forth. You don't think that gives them well, if two are doing it, hey, well, I feel – listen, if – man, y'all don't even understand the ripple effect. And I didn't even know Tua was cussing back at Flores until um, we heard the story recently on the, on the podcast about it. Well, Omar Kelly now. I actually, I thought, you know, hey, that's a little tough. I kind of like that. But real leaders, they're going to take that from the superior. And show everybody else that the superiors to be respected. And if I'm taking it, y'all sure better take it. But when you're acting out, it's no different than normal life. Y'all know how this go all the way in school. If the leader is acting out, then the rest of the followers ain't gonna they gonna act out. 
if the leader ain't, ain't feeling something, that's just how it works. Against good teams, Buffalo 2, Eagles, KC 2, Cowboys, Ravens, Tua's 9 touchdowns, 7 interceptions against all other 20 touchdowns, 7 interceptions. He only good against the bad teams. Yeah. That's, yeah. Raphael said, TD for GM, let's draft the QB. I don't want to be the general manager. What I want to do is be the I want to be the guy who in there criticizing everything and giving a logical reason why it's a stupid idea. Well, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Well, have you considered this? Have you considered that? How would that do for this? I want to be the guy coming and say, why are you not looking at fields? Well, I don't want the issues with, with, with you know, the, the drama. So we're hiding from drama? Is that what we're doing as an organization? Something that could potentially help the team? Or, you know, I mean, that's what we're doing? Hiding from drama? Like, that, that's all that's happening. It's just crazy. We all want to win. <laughs> we all want to win. We all want this team to win. But I'm sorry. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of preaching the hope and fun of this team and we all looking dumb, dumb, boo-boo the fool in the face at the end of the season. And then we go straight to blaming what don't need to be blamed. Who the scapegoat? Who the scapegoat? Who can we blame it on? Who can we attribute it to? Can, can we use injuries this year? Can, 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 can we use coach this year? Can, can we use the defensive coordinator this year? What is it? Can we use, you know, drop passes? O line this year, which one can we use? Stay Zuda said, This isn't helping, it's dividing because the vision is the new money maker. Yeah, hey, you know what? Um, I don't know about the money part because I don't make much, um, doing these streams. Um, I, I, I make tons with sponsorships. Um, so I could come on here for five minutes and tell y'all, man, the Dolphins go win the Super Bowl this year. Y'all gotta believe me. This is brought to you by this and that. And then I can get off and I'm 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 good. So I don't know how this is a money maker. Me coming on spending hours um telling the truth. Cause I can come do a five minute stream as long as I hit my bit. <laughs> th that that's where it is. So this ain't the money maker you think it is for me. Telling the truth. Because if it was about money, I'd be nothing but hopeful and optimistic because that's the money maker. That is the money maker. Big time. Big time. If I gave you the optimistic and super chats are rolling through all night, all kind of colors and all of that, I can care less about a sponsor. <laughs> so uh, th that's how that works. So you're very misinformed in regards to that. And another thing, as far as causing division, let's get something straight. Truth don't cause division. Ignorance causes division. The truth don't cause division. At all. Ignorance does. Facts, by the way. Um, um, I'll say this. I've done nothing but study this team year after year. And when I get information, it's just a hypothesis, right? This happened, that happened, that happened. When I put it all together, this is what I believe. It's an opinion. It's a hypothesis. If anybody who has a basic level of education, just middle school education, when you got your hypothesis, you have to study it. 
so that you can review your findings and see if you can turn it into a factual box or um or wrong you you want to you want to test your hypothesis to see if it's right or wrong and i say something and i say time will tell and then when time tells we take that hypothesis and we put it in a box of whether it was right or wrong i'm testing everything everything we talk about over here is it, 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 we test it this goes all the way back this goes all the way back. All the moves we make, the reason why we make moves, all those things, we test them. We might trade Laramie Tunsil, y'all. This is an idiot. I can't listen to this guy no more. Here's the data to suggest we might trade him. Uh, you just make his stuff up. He gets traded. Those people are silent. We do not need to continue with Xavier Howard. What are we doing? Bro, why are you hating on X, man? He the best thing we got. Why would you trade him now? Then I give you the evidential data to tell you why. Number one, corners have a shelf life of X, Y, and Z. Unless you're the one out of every 100 corner, the Daryl, Re the Revis, the, the Dion's, like you got to be that one out of 100. And, and X also has an injury history. It's unlikely. I give you so much data. Plus, we're rebuilding. Why would you keep him through that? Bro, we need to trade him. That's just your opinion. Yeah, it is. Let's test it. Time will tell. Ogba is not as good as y'all think he is. Okay, oh, he had like 10 sacks. It was Brian Flores' system. When you run a zero, one or two guys are unevaded to the quarterback all the time. Eight of his 10 sacks were unevaded to the quarterback with no resistance. Bro, you hating on that man. In this system, he going to eat under Fangio. No, he not. Because Fangio don't like the zero blitz. He barely like blitzing. He got a straight up rush. <laughs> like like four on five. That's your opinion, bro. Okay, I gave you the evidential data to support my opinion. Now let's test it. Time will tell. Didn't even want the man on the field. These are the things we do over and over and over in every aspect of this team. I give you my opinion. I give you evidential data to support it. We tested it. And then whenever it all come out the exact way I told you, it's, bro, you being negative. You're dividing people. You're dividing people. And the sad thing is, at least I'm giving you evidential data to support what I'm saying. Other people out here just giving you the hope with no data. To go ball against all the great teams this year. <laughs> what do you have to make us feel good about that? They don't have to have nothing because it's what you want to hear. They told you that last year. Tua's not going to crumble in the big games this year. And watch, he's going to prove everybody wrong. What evidential data do you have to suggest that? Did you see what he did to Denver? That ain't evidence. <laughs> that ain't evidential data. You don't have to have evidential data because it's what you want to hear. So you don't need the reasons why somebody's telling you that. I've already explained to you what we do on this channel. And if I'm ever gloating about something being a good thing, that means it's actually good because I have evidential data to suggest that it's good. Y'all don't think I think every day. What can I say positive on the channel? If I go through that process right now, I want to say something really good about, about the, the, the team right now. Okay, try hard. Let's find something really good that has evidential data to back it up. Okay. And, and you start going through the whole roster. You're like, mm, okay, to... Uh, I'd be selling hope. Uh, uh, 
Achan, yeah, he's he he's a positive. Yeah, I hope he's not injury prone. I really do. Hold on. Mo Mostert, but well, he ain't gonna be here that much longer. He getting old. Come on, it's somebody. Tyreek, oh, he's a rental. But he good, he good, he good. He's a rental. Anyway, for this team, long term, something we can feel great about the future. What is it? Come on, you can find something. Waddle. Oh, look at Chris Greer history. His price is going to be 25 plus. Uh, is Greer going to make him walk? And he always limping. But he good. He good. He good. Uh, Philip. No, uh, major injury. Ch same thing. Chubb. Um, come on, man. Find something. Austin Jackson got better. He got better. <laughs> he got better. Austin Jackson got better. He, he got a little better. <laughs> he got a little better. Yeah. Austin Jackson got a little better. We got one a little better. Um, uh, uh, come on, come on. You got something. Uh, you can find something. You can find something else. You can find something else. Can y'all help me? Can y'all help me? Y'all leaving me on the island by myself. Put it in the chat. The things that I should be like, man, this is great for us in the future. Like, help me. It's, especially y'all that's saying I'm being negative and divisive. Y'all should be the first ones offering some help right now. And then I don't just put what's positive. Give us the reason why. Come help me, please. Phillip's rehab going well. <laughs> okay. His rehab going well. Can you tell me the last player who rehab wasn't going well? <laughs> okay. Um, um, come on, somebody help me. I already said a chain. Just hope you ain't injury prone. Somebody help me. So all y'all who be talking about I'm negative, do you see how hard it is for the chat to help me? Do you see? And you can't help me yourself because I don't see a lot of y'all talking. Somebody said Holland. We done talked about Holland. I need Holland to prove something. Just like Tua. Why is it in the in the in the in the biggest games, Holland's a bum? But nobody notices that. Holland has his worst game in the biggest games. Nobody notices it. Mm. <laughs> Somebody said we re-signed burials. Man, I, I done made my point. I done made my point. I have made my point. And, and to further elaborate on that point, you out here, other people, they'll tell you the positive stuff, but they ain't giving you the reason why it's positive. That's why they can say anything. Tua's going to get better with his weight, speed, and agility this year. Yeah, I like hearing that, but, but nothing to suggest that it's going to make a difference. No, 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 no data behind it that suggests it's gonna make a difference. Sealer's gonna be, you know, one of the top guys. This that's all I'm saying. All right. Um, our punter know the offense. So yeah, I, I made my point, man. I made my point. That's all I'm saying to you. I want to see this team win, and in order for us to do that, we have to address our weaknesses. But how are we ever going to address our weaknesses if we're even scared to talk about them? Because anytime somebody bring them up, they haters or negative. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. That's why I'm telling y'all that it's, it's a loser mentality. It's a loser mentality to ignore the weaknesses. Well, you don't have to talk about them. I'm sorry. It's just how I feel. That's my opinion, right? Um, let's get to some of the super chats, you know, some people showing love, you know, Hey, um, maybe division yeah, making some money now, huh? <laughs> oh man. Julio just gave a donation just because ain't no message under it. Thank you. Julio. King cat. What up, King cat? Man, I, I ain't seen you in a, in a little bit, homie. He says, sup TD. I hope all is well with you and your fam. Thoughts on the Jets offseason and how you feel we match up if healthy um with your fins. 
Um, go Jets. I'm glad you said that. I'm going to address that when I finish the Super Chats because I'm going to show the Dolphin fans what I'm talking about by using the Jets, okay? All right. Exposed 305 said two a time. Let's go, baby. I hope so. King Cat said, I feel like it will come down between the Jets and the Fins for the division. I agree. Probably within a game that decides it. I am pretty low on the Bills this year. Don't tell DM. Dan Mitchell. I agree. That's my sentiments, too. I think the Jets are really making strides and Bills are falling. And we're kind of like staying where we are with a little bit of a decline in certain areas. But it still keeps us competitive, you know, and up there. Pete said, Tua gained weight to help um, him survive a full season TD. Now he's going back to injury-prone weight. You know, stop being negative, Pete. That's what they call it, but that's a good observation. But I want to go back to what King Cat asked. You know, how do I feel about the Jets offseason, right? Now watch this. Watch this. So, oh, by the way, Jalen Ramsey is a huge positive on our team. That's the one solidified positive on our team because he doesn't even have to be a rental. When you look at his age, you can still keep him for quite some years if you want. So Ramsey is one of the biggest positives on our team, more positive than Tyreek Hill, in my opinion. Not more valuable, obviously, but more positive because I feel like you can move forward with the Jalen Ramsey, even on a new contract if necessary, if he continues to play at a high level. All right, that's just just give you something that I just thought about positive. Um, all right, so let's go with the Jets, right? Thoughts on the Jets offseason and how you feel we match up. So first, you got to understand the Jets. I'm very critical of Aaron Rodgers. I call him a bum. I say two is better than him right now. That still may not be saying much, but people think I troll when I say that. I believe it or not, y'all, like straight up, non-trolling TD, Tua is better than Aaron Rodgers right now until he proves otherwise. Oh, he tripping. Okay, call me tripping. Tua, in my opinion, is better than Aaron Rodgers right now because I'm, I like going off of what have you done for me lately. And I'm not talking about his injured season. Aaron Rodgers last season in Green Bay, he was not a gr good quarterback. He was slightly above average. And Tua is playing good. So that's the level right above, above average. Y'all know my scale. Average, above average, good, really good, great, elite. Tua's good. Tua's played good football. He collapses at the end because early in the season, Tua was playing great. His woes during that time, he was playing average at best. But I still didn't put him to above average. I put him at good when you look at the whole body of work. He's played good. Aaron Rodgers has played above average at best in his last year in Green Bay. That's why I say two is better than him right now. Now, Aaron Rodgers come out with his weapons and he rips it apart, this and that. Okay, that changes. I'm just talking about right now in this very moment. Okay? And that still may not be saying much. But get mad at me all you want. I personally feel like in this very moment, two is better than Aaron Rodgers, right? Um. The Jets' run running game, solid. I mean, they're fine. They don't have any issue, just like our running game. We're fine. We worry about injuries in that position. They got to worry about injuries at that position. Same difference, right? Wide receivers, they just got a little better. Everybody want to knock the um, the um, the um, Williams um, um, pickup or whatever. But this is why... I could be positive about the Jets receiver pickup. Oh, you're positive about their move, but you're not positive about the Dolphins. I could be positive about the Teron Smith pickup. You could be positive about they old lineman, but you can rank on Teron Armstead always getting hurt, but you're praising their Tyron Smith, and he's always hurt. There are distinct differences of why I praise the Jets' Tyron Smith in their receiver pickup for injured players and not ours because their general manager wasn't dumb enough to give him a guap of guaranteed money. Like, look at Tyron Smith's contract. It's $6.5 million guaranteed out of $20 million. You only guaranteed six and a half million out of the 20 and the rest of the 
13 and a half million dollars is all incentive based on if you play games. That's genius. You think I got a problem with a healthy Teron Armstead? Heck no. I got a problem with the hurt Teron Armstead that we got to keep paying. The Jets went and got a hurt Tyron Smith, but they ain't got to pay him if that proves to be true. That's why I praise the move. Tyron Smith, when he on the field and healthy, is one of the best in the league. And you pay him for it. Teron Armstead, when healthy, is one of the best in the league, and you pay him for it. But when Tyron Smith get hurt and Teron Armstead get hurt, unfortunately, we got to keep paying, and they don't. So miss me with the how can you be happy about that, but always talking about Teron Armstead. It's always ignorance. And I explain myself, so stop getting in your feelings. I explain why I feel the way that I feel. Now, those are facts. That's not an opinion. Go look at how the contracts are mainly constructed. It's not opinion. It's fact. Those are facts. Okay? So when you look at the Jets, they put all that work in on the O-line to solidify um, every position just about to protect Aaron Rodgers. Um, when you look at their defense, their linebackers, their defensive line, their cornerbacks. We already know what their defense is. We're going into our situation with questions. Can our defense be good? Let's rely on Anthony Weaver. He's going to make the difference. I want to ask y'all a question in the chat. Do y'all think that Anthony Weaver is going to be more successful than Vic Fangio on the defensive side of the ball? You can be hopeful. I'm just, I'm literally, I'm legitimately asking. I actually don't have an answer because none of us know. But what do you think? You think that Weaver is going to automatically have more success than Vic Fangio did, having us at the number four defense at one point until the injuries took place? Time will tell, but tell me what you think. You think that we're going to be what? The, the best defense in the league? Second best, third best, fourth best? Just curious. Somebody said not this year, but eventually – Y'all said that about Fangio. Where the first, I said it too. Where the first year, you know, you can't expect much, but the year after, when they get continuity, he only lasted one year. Somebody said Ty. Interesting. I think so. I think our personnel fits a man scheme way better than a zone. Yeah, I'm a little worried about the man scheme with this team. I'm worried about the cornerback opposite of Jalen Ramsey, especially if we go with the guy that gave up nine touchdowns last year. We'll see. Time will definitely tell. Defense will rank 15 to 20th. I ain't going to lie. That would be a disaster for us. And that ain't bad. <laughs> 15 to 20 ain't bad, honestly, but it would be a disaster for this team. Be honest with you, we're going to need a defense this top 10. Honestly, top five, but beggars can't be choosers. I don't want to have a goal post. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, that's something that terrifies me. That terrifies me, the defensive side of the ball. We're weak in the middle in the run defense. Like, let me tell you, I don't want to go back to the days. Do y'all remember them days when we had Cam Week? And you, you but put it like this. Y'all remember the days where we couldn't stop the run to save our life. That's why we had to go invest in Indomitian Sue. Like we had like four years straight that we just can't stop the run. <laughs> we just can't stop the run. 
team shit. Like, I ain't gonna lie. One of the most demoralizing things is when a team is pounding a rock on you and you just seem feel hopeless. Like, gosh, another seven, another six, 13. Oh, two. Oh, 11. Like, when teams just pounding the rock on you, right up the middle. Y'all remember them days? Y'all remember those days? That's what I'm worried about. And on top of it, let's not sit here and act like we even know what Anthony Weaver's going to run. We still trying to figure out if he going to stick with the 3 4 and, or if he's still going with the 4 3 5. Two, I mean, we don't even know. We have no clue. Somebody said those days are gone now. We got Tua. What Tua got to do with stopping another team run? So that's what was interesting to me that I'm a little bit concerned about is, you know, stopping the run and not getting picked on at the cornerback position. Giving up touchdowns and stuff like that. So we'll see. I'm excited, though, to see how it develops and comes together because we all got a lot of unknowns. I can't wait to training camp to sit back and just look at the defense and evaluate it to see how those guys look on the field. I can't wait. I'm excited about it. I'm excited to watch the defense this year. I'm not really interested in watching the offense. I'm going to watch the offense and report it. but. Unless I see new wrinkles, unless I see a whole new system, um, it is what it is. I want to really see the defense because, guys, we're not going to do anything if the defense isn't, isn't solid. It's just not going to happen. Um, but, yeah, y'all punch that like button real quick. Let me see. Let me pull it up to see how many likes we got. Uh, Julio says, speaking truth or not, TD, this is likely to only have fans circle the wagon. Uh, uh, elaborate, because I, I think I understand, but maybe I don't. It's only to have the fans circle the wagon. Uh, you know, I guess come back and revisit it or something. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I don't understand that one, um, but explain so I can better respond to it. Uh, we'll we will get you back on boat TD um, when the season starts. Uh, get me back on boat or board. I'm on board. I'm on board every year. I just I'm just a realist. When I go into the season, I predict what I believe is going to happen. If it's good, it's exciting. If I predict bad, I will leave myself open to be shocked, in which I hope that I am. Unfortunately, for the last four to five years, I've predicted bad, and that's how it ended. Um, this year, Last year, we won one game more than I predicted. I told y'all the low end is not win. Um, I said the low end was 10 wins, and I said the high end was 12. And I said we'll win. Um, no, no, no. I said the high end was 11, and the low end was 9, and we're going to win 10. And I was off by one game. And the main game that I kind of got wrong was that Chargers game, week one. For some reason, they came out on defense just terrified of us. It was total different defense than they ran the year before when they obliterated us. Totally against what they did that year. Didn't put their hands on a single receiver the year before that. They were bumping them all over the place and gloated about that was the game plan. And for some reason, in week one, just went out the window, never even tried it. 
So I was certain we were going to lose that game. But I didn't expect them to fold on defense like that. Um, And yeah, the Tennessee game I didn't expect, but it was a trade-off with the Cowboys. It was three games that I got wrong picking all year. And that was that we were going to lose to the Cowboys and we won, that we were going to beat Tennessee and we lost, and that we were going to lose to um, the Chargers and we won. So I was off on three games out of all my predictions, which I need to start betting on on the Dolphins. I could have got 14 out of 17 weeks right. Yeah. But, um, But yeah, I was off by one game in my prediction. The year before that, I was um, off by one game as well. Um, But we actually won one less game than I predicted the year before that. So I had predicted too many the year before that. So I was over-optimistic. Jermaine said they could have easily won 12 games. Um, And they could have easily have won 10. Same difference. Chargers game, they could have easily have lost that. They could have easily have only won nine. Chargers game and the Cowboys game. Cowboys game, we were trash. We were trash. And thank God for the two goal line stands we had in that game. Deshaun Elliott made one on the goal line, literally at the one-yard line, forced the field goal, and the one right before halftime, right at the goal line, Jerome Baker. Stop the seven points. We were trash in that game. And wasn't there also like this touchback or something like that? They fumbled through the end, or was that the Chiefs game? I don't remember. I don't remember, but we could have easily only won nine games. So it could have went either way in a lot a lot of games. And yeah, we could have won 12. Yeah. For sure. They fumbled at the goal line. Yeah, so they just they really blew that game. They, they had all kind of opportunities. That's why I say that Deshaun Elliott goal line stop stopped them from getting seven. They got three. The Jerome Baker before the half, half stopped them from getting any points because time ran out. They couldn't even get the three. And then they fumbled on the Dak Prescott, or like the first drive or second drive or something like that. They fumbled right away. <laughs> we should have lost that game if it wasn't for their own dumb, dumb mistakes. A win is a win, bro. Yeah, it is, Jermaine. But why? See, that's what I'm talking about, Jermaine. You want to talk about hypocrisy and contradiction? You want to say a win is a win, but you want to bring up we could have won, we could have easily won 12, but you didn't. A loss is a loss. But I say the flip side of it, and you want to say a win is a win, bro. You got to stop that, man. That's hypocrisy. Big time. But I agree with you, though. A win is a win, but a loss is also a loss. So we won 11. So it is what it is. Um, Back-to-back playoff appearances. A lot of people hold a hat on that. I'm going to be honest with you. That's what's driving a lot of people in, in, in thinking that things are better now. Back-to-back playoff appearances. Is it, like, unfair to say that they haven't been hard rides to the playoffs? With the combination of of weak schedules and a depleted AFC, and when I say depleted, I'm talking about, you know, Trevor Lawrence getting hurt. We're talking about Joe Burrow getting hurt. A lot of these guys going down. And some of these guys are certified playoff teams every year. I think a lot of people think that we're that much of a better team because we made two playoff appearances in a row. And I say two years ago when we won, what was it, nine games or something like that, and we made the playoffs, and the previous regime made 10 and didn't make the playoffs, what makes that any different? It was we were more fortunate or lucky, however you want to put it. But it doesn't matter making it. You got to at least win that one. Losing in the first round is no different from not making it. (laughs) 
And that's where I, that's how I feel. Losing in the first round is no different than not making it. There was still no, no further advancement. You just got an opportunity to lose. Especially if it ain't at home to give your own fans a home playoff game. That's it, it, it. Even if you lose, at least that's the reward. But if you don't even have a home playoff game, dang, how did we blow last season? Everything was in our favor. How did you blow last season? And I, it sucks that I keep going to that Tennessee game too, because the Tennessee game was the home court, home field advantage. We weren't gonna beat Baltimore, Buffalo, or the Chiefs anyway. But that Tennessee game would have been home field advantage, and I, I'm wondering who we would have played in the first round if 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 we would have had that Tennessee game. If we had that Tennessee game. And I was sure we were going to get over the Tennessee hump. I knew their defense was going to cause a few problems. But a rookie quarterback, man. Oh, that game just it was disgusting. A disgusting feeling. And I hate that game so much because people have the wrong perception about that game to me. It's like. Everybody wants to solely put that game on the defense. The defense sold at the end. Even if the defense sells and you're up by three possessions, all your offense got to do is do what the other th offense is doing. Keep the separation. Like, Offense and defense sold in the fourth quarter. Both. Defense couldn't stop uh, uh, to stop them to save their life, and the offense couldn't produce to secure the game to save their life. Yeah, JP, our defense was meh. But did you see our offense three straight possessions? We had three straight possessions, three chances. Three possessions to secure the game. And I'm going to tell you now, when, when we were up by 14, it was one first down. All we had to do was get one first down. One first down. Four minutes left. i never forget, too. Our offense had the ball. It was four minutes left. I mean, our offense had the ball. I'm like, listen, get one first down. One first down, and we had the two-minute warning. Just get one first down. We didn't give it. We gave them the ball. I said, okay, just one first down in the game over. Get one first down in the game over. We didn't get it again. And then we tied and one for, it's, 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 just go score. Go, go do so. Defense, make a stop. All right, you didn't make that stop. Make this one. All right. We blew it three times on offense. Save us. And you know the messed up part about it? The defense has saved us the whole game. They were playing better than we did. We, I don't know if y'all remember. Three and a half quarters, we were like, the defense been on point tonight. The defense actually were balling out. They gave um like, everything they did was lucky. Like, the deep pass where... um what you call it, pushed off a little. Everything they got was lucky, and it was that it was always the one big play, lucky. We were dominating them on defense. 
And this is why I always tell people, your defense can only hold but so long. They can only hold but so long. And at some point, an offense also is responsible from holding the team off too. Hopkins, big push off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. On X or something. I remember that push off. Just a sad night. And that game did it all. But even though we probably would have played Buffalo in the first round, at least we would have been home. We would have gave our fans a home game in the first round. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the defense scored seven points earlier. Uh, you, you, uh, you reminded me. You're right. The defense actually put up seven points for us. They actually helped us score. <laughs> when you really think about it. Somebody said two or blue a three game lead with five games left for the division. Pay him 50 million, please. He didn't blow it. The team blew it. He contributed in blowing it, but the team blew it. Not just him. The team as a whole blew it. Um Titans won because they were more physical. Yeah, I mean, every team that, that out physicals us wins. Every team. This is why I be saying to people, they be like, oh, well, we got tougher with the guys we brought in. Robert Hunt wasn't getting bullied on the field. Christian Wilkins wasn't getting bullied on the field. Connor wasn't getting bullied. These narratives don't make sense. Van Ginkle wasn't getting bullied. X wasn't getting bullied. Oh, we brought in tougher guys. The guys we lost weren't getting bullied. Maybe you got one tougher linebacker. You can't put everything on the quarterback as a team game. That's what I said. I said the team. Lost that um thing to a contributed, <laughs> just like you know other players contributed, you know um. But that's what I always say about the quarterback: when you lose, don't be a part of the reason why. When you're contributing to it, that ain't a franchise quarterback. When you're contributing to some of the losses, that's not a franchise quarterback. You don't even have to have a great game. But don't be the one turning it over in the fourth quarter and late in the game in, in key moments. Don't be the one slipping and messing up in the key moments. Tua is a good quarterback, y'all. The biggest issue that people don't want to realize is that he's good enough not to be good enough. So he's going to help you win games every year. You know, you, you, you can win games every year. He's not a bum. He's not a slouch. He used to be to me, but not anymore. But you'll always be stuck at that point. Can we get over the hump? And here's what's going to mess us up. At some point, we might even win one playoff game. Let me ask y'all a question. You saw Tony Romo's career. Never could get past the first round, really. Just always the same. Good quarterback. Winning games every year. First round exits. Maybe just missed the playoffs or first round exit. One out of every eight years, you win one playoff game and that's it. Right? Dak Prescott. Exact same thing. Don't make the playoffs or you just sneak in. 
And once every seven years, you might win one playoff game, but that's as far as you go. If someone could tell you, like say you were the Cowboys general manager, and somebody told you that this is exactly what Romo is going to do, this is exactly what Dak Prescott is going to do, would you move on and keep on searching for a franchise quarterback? Or would you go ahead and elect to go through those 15 years of first-round exits and once every seven, eight years, you might win one playoff game and be out? If you had hindsight and somebody said, this is your future, which one would you elect? Go ahead looking for a new quarterback or taking that good guy that ain't going to get you over the hump? What would you do? Move on or stick with it if you know ahead of time. Remember, that's the key here. If you know that's what you're going to get, you're competitive every year, but you know that's the end result. Which one are you going to do? Hmm. Who is not winning a playoff game? TD, stop. <laughs> Tua is better with a different team. Romo was never it. Depends on the team around him because that could compensate for it. No, 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 but we know the outcome. We know what's going to happen. I mean, we're playing a fairy tale. We know what's going to happen. This is what the end result is going to be. I know we don't know what's going to happen with Tua, but in that scenario, I think everybody would move on if you knew that the best you could do was a once every eight years, first round win and then second round exit, the best you could do. Everybody would go ahead and draft the next guy to see if they could hit him. And if not, draft the next guy, they would. But that's what I think is in store with us for Tua. We're going to sign him on a big deal. Two years from now, we might even win our first playoff game. Then right after that, we might miss the playoffs. Then after that, we make it first round exit. Then after that, we make it first round exit. Then after that, we miss. And then after that, that that's what I see in Tua. The exact same. See, this is why I've always told y'all the worst quarterback you can have in the NFL is the one that's good enough not to be good enough because they'll be always good enough for you to feel, man, if we just figure out the formula around them, we can do it. But you never can figure out the formula around them to do it. And the formula gets harder and harder the more money they make. It's exactly who he is. Zero carry ability. Zero put the team on their back ability. That's the issue. Tua can't compete against good teams on a rookie deal. Let's give him 50 million and see <laughs> what happens. Offensive team, um, seven points in playoffs. What a joke. Yeah, that's the running theory. But a lot of people don't care about that. A lot of people don't care about that. And we'll see. You know, there's, you know, you never know what happens. I mean, I think the $23 million cap it this year is still friendly for the team. When they sign them on the big deal this offseason, Next year's cap hit won't be massive. It'll also be low. It'll, you know, it'll help the team. The year after that, the cap hit won't be massive. It'll be low. Like the next three years, the cap hit actually won't be that big at all. 2027 is going to be astronomical, unbearable. And there's no escaping it. Um, so we'll keep on trying at it. 
The real question is, they might be digging themselves in for the next two to three years. I was shocked today when they ex- they um restructured Bradley Chubb. They restructured him, saved capped on an injured guy. So what happens is, <clears throat> even if you cut him next year, post June first, it'll be a twenty million dollar cap um dead money. Um, they could spread it out. Matter of fact, I want to see if they got the details to the contract yet. Y'all give me a second. Let me see. Um, All right. I'm going to see if they updated it, guys. I want to see how good or bad it's going to look. All right. Yeah, so. um, So they restructured it. Um, hold on. 24 salary fully guaranteed. So Bradley Chubb, we work. Okay. I'm not sure if this reflects the update or not. Yeah, it does. Roster restructure. Yeah, it does. So this year he's a almost $16 million cap hit. Next year he goes to $29 million cap hit. 2026, 29 million. 2027, 29 million. His base salary next year is 19 and a half million. And even next year, if they convert that into signing bonus, because at a minimum, there's no way around it. He's going to be a $10 million cap hit, $11 million cap hit next year, no matter what, even if, even if they restructure, but if they do restructure, they are really kicking that can. 27 million dead cap next year. 18 million dead cap the year after. But if they restructure him next year and convert money, then they're really eating a lot of dead cap in the years that he won't even be here. I'm telling y'all, 2026 is going to be the most interesting year for the Dolphins from a salary cap perspective. It'll be very interesting to see how they manage it. But I was shocked when they did that. Guy coming off of that. And again, they say the potential out is next year, 2025. And maybe he does get out of it next year and eat $27.5 million a dead cap. Um, Now, we will be able to spread it out, but still. Let me see something over. All right, NFL salary cap tracker. All right, so where's Miami? We should have got a lot more money. So right now we have $13.5 million of cap space, and that's using the rule of 51. So you only need to count your top 51 contracts up until the season starts. Then you count the 53 when you make the full roster. Um, But that money is set aside right now for number one, the draft picks, and number two, some of the contracts that they just signed have not been reflected yet. So the Dolphins are $13.5 million cap space. You always want to start the season around $15 million in cap space after the draft picks. Now, we're going to need about seven or eight for the draft picks. So they're going to, I think they're going to figure out a way to get a, a little bit more money too. I know we got X money coming at some point, but we'll see how that goes because when you have injured players, you want to have the money 
to be able to make the moves necessary. Because when you got injured players, the league don't say, hey, we'll let you go over the cap for your injured players. No. So, yeah. Hmm. 2726. Let me see something real quick. The Miami Dolphins are the fifth oldest team in the NFL. Right now, we are the fifth oldest team in the league. Fifth oldest. Hmm. Mm. Didn't realize that. We wonder why the injuries be piling up. Just two years ago, we were one of the youngest. That's revelation. That's a revelation right there. We are the fifth oldest team in the league, and we were literally one of the youngest two years ago. That shows you right there a whole bunch of draft picks didn't work out and a whole bunch of guys they didn't resign and they went with veterans. They scrapped that whole rebuild process, y'all. They scrapped it. Straight scrapped it. And look at this. The fifth youngest team in the league is the Kansas City Chiefs. The fourth, the Kansas City Chiefs winning Super Bowls are the fourth youngest team. Their future is bright, man. Their future is bright. And they got $16 million right now, cap space. Very interesting stuff happening. Very interesting. All right. Let's go to 2025 real quick. See if these numbers change at all. All right. So look at there. Look at that. Yesterday, we had $60 million in cap space for next year. See what I'm talking about? People yelling at me, you don't know nothing about the cap. We got all these draft picks and we got $60 million for next year. I say when they do these restructures, when they sign Waddle and all of them guys and pick up a few fifth-year options, we're going to be heavy negative again. They haven't even re-signed people yet. And yesterday we had $60 million and here we are today with 34 and a half million next year. 34 and a half million next year. It's already coming down. So what do you think is going to happen if Waddle is a fifth year option? What do you think is about to happen when Tua, who's not even counted in this number, his contract kicks in? What do you think is going to happen in Jalen Phillips if they pick up the fifth-year option? I don't know if they do. I don't know. That's the biggest mystery. Are they picking up Jalen Phillips' fifth-year option? Jermaine said, what's the average age then? Or are you saying next year? Let's see. The average age next year, the Dolphins will be 10th. 10th in the league next year. At least as of for those who are under contract right now. Yes or no? Dolphins franchise tag Jalen Phillips. Not franchise tag. Fifth year option. Do they fifth-year option Jalen Phillips? 
And don't say franchise tag because the fifth year option is way cheaper than the franchise tag. Franchise tag, again, you're taking the average of the top three salaries at the position. Or is it? Because will he get treated like Michael Parsons? Is he going to be treated like a linebacker or an edge? That's a, you know what? That's a good question there. But either way, here's my point. It's probably going to be somewhere like a 15 plus million dollar hit. Whatever decision they make. So when you talk about him, Waddle's fifth year. Matter of fact, come to think of it, I should be able to pull that up. I could tell you now if they, I should be able to. Let me see if it shows me. Waddle's fifth year option will be at 16 million. Let me go Phillips. Uh, I don't know why it just froze on me. Over the cap, red forty eight million next year, but it did do ten million. Uh, uh well, I'm not following what you're saying, so the difference. Oh man. I don't know why my spool track just literally just froze on me. So aggravating. Let me pull it back up. Let me review this again. Give me one second. Effective cap space, active cap spending, cap space. Yeah, over the cap got us with less money right now. So I'm not sure if they're actually updated. And I see what you're saying. It has it, they're not updated fully. I think Spotrax is um more up to date right now. I'll get the accurate tomorrow. But you see, but you notice regardless, the numbers coming down. The numbers starting to come down more and more. Better to trade him than let him walk like Wilkins. But my point is when you look at it, matter of fact, I was gonna go to Phillips. So um Spotrack. NFL spool track. All right. Um, let me go Phillips. And let's see what his fifth year option. All right. So his fifth year option. Oh, oh it'll only be 13 million. So 16 and 13. That's 29 million between those two. Let me see if they have a market value for Holland. Because that one I'm really interested in is how much is Javon Holland going to make? Uh, it's not showing us and it's not going to. Because there is no fifth year option and they don't have the projected um, salary for a new deal yet. The big question is how much is Javon Holland going to make? What is his contract going to look like? 
And let me see. All right. Highest paid free safety in the league. Let me see. Highest paid free safeties. Safeties. All right. Um, Derwin James, Minka Fitzpatrick, average about nineteen million, and the salary cap went up. He's gonna get about eighteen million probably because the salary cap went up, and these guys got their deals before it even went up that much. So the new norm, you might have some twenty plus million dollar safeties coming down the pipeline. Very interesting. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's what the going rate is going to be. What up, Alexander? Yeah, when you think about it, right now, the highest paid safety making $19 million per year annually. Like, that's the average. With about two years worth of guarantees. So I could really see Javon Holland because right now the value at the position with the salary cap going up, um, like uh, I don't know, I think it went up like 30 million or something on a two, two twenty something, and it went up 30 million. When you do the math, 10, 15. It went up like 12% or something like that. So if you take 19 million times 0.12, it went up like two and a half million dollars. So the new going rate could be 21 and a half million for the top guy. If Mika or Durwin were getting a contract today and they were still worth it, their value is somewhere around 21 and a half. So Holland's definitely going to be pushing 18 or 19 potentially. He might he might get 18 or 19. The way things are now in the NFL. So I know Chris Greer. Chris Greer going to be offering him a four-year, $60 million deal, 15 per. And if he take it, great. If he don't, he betting on himself. And then we also got to look at it like this. That's the value next season. I mean, that's the value this season. Say the cap goes up another hypothetically 20 million, then the new going rate is somewhere around 23. The new going rate will be around 23 million from a um, percentage standpoint. So him betting on himself means that if he plays well and don't get hurt, he could be looking at a $20 million payday knowing that the best of the best could be worth really 23, but he could be, or once again, it's free agency teams as desperate. They'll offer him 23 and we'd be like Robert Hunt situation. So I already know Chris Greer going to be throwing out that 15 million per four year deal, 60 million. And if we can lock that in and Holland's like, Ooh, I just want to take it. I don't want to take chances. Good. But if they can't get a deal done, if they can't get a deal done, he's betting on himself. And that is not good for us. Especially if he plays great and stays healthy. Yeah. And Jermaine said, if they offer him a contract and he doesn't accept, we got to trade him. Is Javon Holland the guy that you want a franchise tag? 
because franchise tagging him would put you at 18 million anyway, but only one season, and it's a hard cap hit that you can't manipulate. So that wouldn't be a good look. <laughs> Because we can't just eat 18 million without being able to flexibly move it. So you wouldn't want to franchise tag them. That's a pretty heavy, um, pretty heavy um cap hit. T Rich said 18 million fully guaranteed top. Fully guaranteed. What do you mean by that? Please explain that one. Um, yeah, Holland's gonna be interesting. If Greer can pull off a 15, maybe 16 million dollar deal per year, okay. Okay. You know, but what is Holland going to do? Being one of the highest rated in the NFL. Has he made any Pro Bowls? I don't remember. Has Javon Holland made any Pro Bowls? Tagging him would make the 18 million fully guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why it ain't it, it ain't feasible for us. We can't take a, at this point, we can't survive on an $18 million cap hit just straight up that you can't even manipulate or or alter the money and push it on the back end. We can't. So franchise tags is something that the Dolphins aren't in a position to where they really want to do. That's why nobody got tagged this year. So, man... Holland's going to be interesting, but just the thought that you have to replace him, you replace Christian Wilkins, you replace Robert Hunt. If you end up replacing Javon Holland, fifth year option prove it deal sounds so good to me. We're talking about Javon Holland. Ain't no fifth year option. He was a second round pick. Oh, you're talking about Tua. Okay. Holland is a wild card in all of this. And somebody say, if you don't accept to trade him, when you're going to trade him at the trade deadline? And then you don't have a safety for this year for your team? They're going to re-sign Holland. They're going to have to give them the bag now so they can spread it out. They're going to sign them, y'all. <laughs> Interesting. But all I'm saying is at this very moment, the Jalen Waddle and Jalen Phillips will take up $29 million of cap space next year on fifth year options. And that will bring our cap down to 9 million right there. You got to do Tua's new deal. You got to do Javon Holland potentially. And then you got a lot of players that you got to fill holes with to replace all these one-year guys that you got right now. Mm. Holland don't get a fifth year. Wasn't he a second round? Yeah, that's what we said. The defense was what trash with him, so might as well be trash without him. 
Oh, y'all funny. I mean, he don't he hasn't played well against the good teams, though. If you go look at it, he really ain't played great against the good teams. Other teams are overpaying our players. Look what Hunt and Wilkins got in free agency. Raquan Davis got paid technically when you look at the money. Raquan Davis got more than what we paid Zach Zeeler before we gave him the deal. Van Ginkle. I found out today the Dolphins did offer Van Ginkle. Minnesota offered more. And that shows you we actually tried to retain some of these guys. We just couldn't afford them. And it's about to get worse. We ain't really going to be on the better side of this until Chubb, Tyreek, those two contracts are off the books. It doesn't get better until Chubb and Tyreek's contracts are off the books. But it won't matter because when Tua's money kick in, we're going to be trying to figure it out. So here's the real question. How long can we kick the can before it doesn't make sense and we have a fire sale? Um, I don't think we'll ever have a fire sale. We're setting ourselves up for it just not to make sense for like five years. So you can keep kicking the can. Kicking the can ain't the issue. Well, it is the issue because... Here's the thing with kicking the can. You kick the can and then the you start your off season next year with a bigger negative number. But here's what the Dolphins did this off season. You know how we were like negative 51 million when we started this off season? The signings that we've made so far I think we're going to end up like negative 40 million next year. It actually helped us reduce the number, but we didn't get better. People think we got better. Oh, we kind of upgraded that linebacker. You're massively downgraded at defensive tackle. Your O-line is still a downgrade, and it wasn't even that great to begin with. But you got slightly better at the linebacker, slightly better at the corner maybe. A safety weapon, but you don't know because it's all a mystery with the new scheme or maybe. So we may move. So I think next off season we'll be like, oh, it's not as bad as last year. Negative 41. Here's what's going to happen. When you do all those restructures next year again, you convert um, current salary into the, the um, you, you convert the current salary into bonus next year we're gonna go from 51 to like 40 and then the year after we're gonna be like negative 65 negative 65 another thing you got to realize too is we were negative 51 but thankfully the salary cap increase was like 20 million more than anybody 25 million more than anybody expected we could have easily been negative 70-something. Just imagine if we were negative 70-something and the salary cap didn't go up that like that. We would already have done a restructure for Tyreek, and then we would have been trying to figure out one more solid player that we got to move on from, or we wouldn't have been able to get Shaq. So we were very fortunate that the salary cap went up to where it did because that definitely helped us. Um, but yeah, I think that in 2026, that off season, you're going to see a massive nasty number. You're going to see a nasty number. And then what do you do? convert to a salary into signing bonus. And then 2028, it's even nastier because that's a big contract. You see what I'm saying? So 
That's what I mean. You can keep kicking the can, but every year you're starting at a bigger deficit. And every year you're having a Christian Wilkins, Robert Hunt situation. We had to let him go. We had to let him go. And then every year you start having less and less talent until you say, okay, enough is enough. The fans are going to hate us for this offseason that's coming up because we ain't going to sign really nobody. We're going to get a whole bunch of low-end minimum guys. We're not restructuring deals because we're making it even worse. We got to get out of debt. That's the problem. Once you're in that debt, you got to keep restructuring anyway to get in more debt. And that's where the issue comes. You have to make hard decisions. But I will say, Greer made some sacrifices that can help us in the immediate. Next year, we may not be negative 51. We might be negative like 30 or 40. If it's worse, it's because it can, I don't see it being worse. But if it does end up being worse, then we're in trouble. But I think we'll be not as much in the hole because he sacrificed Christian Wilkins to not be in the hold in the future. He sacrificed Robert Hunt to not be in the hole. Van Ginkle, all these guys, he sacrificed them all. But that's the cost you pay. And you're going to have to make more sacrifices in the future. Because when you pay Waddle, when he goes from making 8 million to 25, that's another 13. Where are you getting it from? Who's getting sacrificed? When you go from May Holland making two, three million to making 20, another 18, where is it coming from? Who are you sacrificing? When you go from two or right now making eight to the 24, you already sacrificed some guys, but it's going to be bigger sacrifices as the new contract, the big one comes into play. So we could kick the can as long as we want, but your roster is going to get weaker. When we look at the Saints, everybody keeps saying this crap about salary cap. It still proves to not be real because the Saints find a way to get out of 80 million negative every year. But their roster is getting worse and worse every year. How are they able to sign that guy for 15 million just now? Their roster overall is still getting worse. Kicking the can while making the roster worse, holding on to what you got. That's what's happening. When they're trying to build through the draft to replace guys, but you can't even keep up. Glenn say they don't have any big contracts right now. Of course they don't. And still, all of that negative money. They can't have a, a big contracts for a while. And if they do, they're making it even worse. They won't be able to bring in enough big contracts to really be, be able to take over that division. Worse and worse. So you won't be able to afford a Tyreek contract. You're going to sign Waddle on a big contract, but how long is that going to last as it gets worse and worse? But Greer understands that he's in a dire situation, so he don't care. He's going to push the envelope as much as he can because if this whole thing fails, for what reason would Stephen Ross keep him? Someone in the locker room said TD the truth and been right all along. Well, Omar Kelly thought he was lying, so he did ain't reported. <laughs> mm. Greer might start some of those sacrifices, TD. I wouldn't be surprised if he trade Waddle or 
Holland or Waddle in the draft. No, he already started the sacrifices, bro. He already didn't keep his own draft picks first round. He let Christian Wilkins go. He let Robert Hunt go. He already making the sacrifices. Van Ginkle. So it is what it is. All right, we're coming up on two and a half hours, man. We kind of got like through two questions and then I'll be going through the chat. So we're going to cut it off and then we'll get back at it tomorrow. Um, thank y'all so much for tuning in. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all again, supporting our sponsors and supporting the channel. The stream is being powered by Bet US, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Remember, take advantage of the bonus of 125% using code JOIN125. Link is in the description of the video. We are out of here for the night. It's time for me to go shower and get some rest, man. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all. If you're new to the channel, come over to TD Fans Talk and subscribe on YouTube, okay? Especially all the Twitter viewers. We got 300 on Twitter watching right now, 400 on um, YouTube. Thank y'all so much. Love y'all. Fans up no matter what. I will see y'all tomorrow. Peace. You boys. Bet US, America's favorite sports book and casino. Live betting and race book. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins.